there. Hey, are you a gamer? Has anyone ever called you a ball player? Do the masses on social media add dog to the end of your name? If so, you could be getting paid big money by the Cincinnati Reds. We'll talk about the players that fit that bill and a whole lot more because you're going to be in the driver's seat on today's live Aloha Friday edition of Locked on Reds. Hit it, Jeff. You are Locked on Reds, your daily Cincinnati Reds podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Reds, you are locked on Reds with myself, Jeff Carr, and my co-host, Stephen Offenbaker. Welcome in to this Aloha Friday live edition of the podcast. Locked on Reds is brought to you by the Locked On Podcast Network. We are your team every day, and Steve and I have been addicted to the Cincinnati Reds for our entire lives, and we've turned that addiction into information for you. On today's Locked On Reds podcast, which by the way, thanks for making us your first listen, we're going to talk about the non-tender deadline. The Reds have some decisions to make on the six players that they have that are arbitration eligible. And the first one and the only one that we really think is up in the air is Kyle Farmer. And we're going to talk about whether or not the Reds should keep him. They should not tender him. I'm sorry. I can't keep that on. Uh, whether they should, uh, you know, what they should do with him and five other guys. They've also made a decision on one of those arbitration eligible players already. We'll tell you who's coming back and we'll take your questions because this is a live edition of the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. And Steve, we're going to start with the question that everybody's wondering. Is Kyle Farmer going to be back? Because when you look at this arbitration list of the six players that we have, I think he's really the only one that we have a question about. I don't know how this podcast today has not been sponsored by farmersonly.com. That is really <laughs> the biggest question mark in we my should, mind yeah. of what is going <laughs> on today. No, listen, uh, uh, I, I threw up the first comment that we received. Apparently your hat is uh, hitting a certain note. You're, you've got a certain look for our YouTube viewers. I uh, didn't know you were Amish there, Jeff. Uh, he was trying out looks earlier, folks, and it was really – he really had a whole get-off-my-lawn thing going early, and he's made some adjustments. So this, hey, believe I wear it or this not – I this to the beach. It's my golf Believe it or not, hat. what you're seeing from Jeff Carr right now is an improvement. Uh, and speaking of improvement, <laughs> Kyle Farmer uh, elevated his game. Every year he's been in Cincinnati, he has improved. He's gotten better. His defense has been good. His, his offense against left-handed pitchers has been good. Uh, he's created a situation for himself where he has an arbitration number, $5.9 million. And I'm not sure that the Reds are in a position to not bring back Kyle Farmer. Yeah, I think that that is really where the big question lies, right? Because there's a lot of make about, well, they're probably going to try and save money because overall, like if you look at his body of work, and we've said this before, if you look at his body of work, it's average to below average. It's not as if he's blowing the doors off of anything here, but who else is going to take his spot? Where else are you going to go? And you've got the added benefit that absolutely everybody corroborates is that he is the leader of this clubhouse. He is the guy that the younger players gravitate toward. He is the guy who helps lead these dudes on when it comes to just the, the, the whole mental makeup of the team and the, and the psychological aspect of it all. So that's a value that it's kind of hard to put in OPS plus, and they don't necessarily uh, equate that into the numbers. So there's a lot to look at when you say, what does he bring to the team that you cannot quantify statistically? And I also just wonder what else are you going to do if you get rid of Kyle Farmer? I, this is what I say, and I don't think that they can. I mean, yeah. I, in baseball dollars, first of all, the $6 million is a drop in the bucket. And right. 
even if Ellie De La Cruz comes into Goodyear in 2023 spring training and plays lights out and takes that shortstop job and runs with it, you still need somebody that can play third base. And Kyle Farmer demonstrated clearly, hands down, last season that he can hold his own on the hot corner. He can play third base. So I, I think I think the Reds have to bring him back. I think his value is such that. He's worth six million dollars, and I know you're going to get into you know some others that agree w- on that as well. And uh, for me, there's nobody else to run out there because if it's a choice between giving Kyle Farmer six million dollars and playing him at third base, or running the bloated corpse, as one of our uh, esteemed podcaster friends uh, likes to use, of Mike Mustakis out there to play defense. <laughs> yeah. and- then spin the tw- spin the six. Listen, I will start the GoFundMe right now for the six million dollars <laughs> if we can keep Mike Mustakis from playing defense in Cincinnati. Well, and we're going to get into the specifics of how the roster is kind of broken down from a financial standpoint here in a few minutes. But basically, there are only three players under contract right now, and that includes the guy they just settled out outside of arbitration with. You have Joey Votto, Mike Mustakis, and Buck Farmer, who we'll talk about here in a little bit. That's it. So if we're worried about the Reds spending $6 million on a guy that's a little bit of a problem. Plus, shout out to our friends over at Reds Content Plus. There's a great article over there that kind of breaks down the value that Kyle Farmer brings to the team. We're not, he's, they do not agree that there should be a captaincy slapped on his chest and he should get a multiple-year contract, but they also don't agree that he should be let go of, and I, I, I tend to be in that camp. I don't see a reason to get rid of Kyle Farmer, especially if you look at this, like if he starts this year, and he really kind of blows up and has like a nice streaky because, you know, he's a bit of a streaky guy. If he has a streaky good month and a half or so, you could trade him and, and you can get some good value for him. So I, I don't think that there's any reason that the Reds should not intend him. They should sign him and hopefully settle with him outside of arbitration. And let's just move forward. You know, I, I agree. I, I think that my only apprehension about bringing farmer back and i I, again i don't think they could not bring farmer back but Mm -hmm. i don't want him to take playing time away from the prospects as they arrive and are ready so if ellie de la cruz is arrived and ready he needs to be the shortstop kyle needs to move if spencer steer uh breaks out in 2023 and needs to be on the field a lot uh, Kyle needs to move around so that Spencer Steer can play a lot of third base. Um, it, it just Kyle Farmer needs to come in with the mindset of he is going to be the veteran super utility that you know shows the guys the way, uh, gets his playing time spread amongst four or five positions, and and understand that you know success for him might mean a, a relocation, but but he's he's valuable. He's valuable until these prospects come take the jobs away from him. And this is where, because we were talking about David Bell yesterday and how he can be a little bit of a player's manager to a fault, this is where he needs to use his player manager skills and be like, look, Kyle, we're going to have an open dialogue with you, but at some point this season, Ellie De La Cruz is coming up, so shortstop's going to be out of the question. And at some point, we're going to have some guy, like Spencer Steer should be playing third base. He should be playing every day at some position. That's a point that we're going to get to in a future episode, but kind of a little bit of a tease there. So they keep him with the caveat that he is flexible with all of that. And if it comes to a point where it's like, all right, start me or trade me, then you trade him because that I think you do right by him to give him the opportunity to play, but then you also have to do right by your roster and not block somebody because Kyle Farmer's there. Well, you know, Jeff, Kyle Farmer is not the only player that the reds have to make arbitration decisions on there are a couple of other names on this list and i think most of them are no-brainers uh luis Sessa's fourth year of arbitration estimated to make 2.6 million dollars lucas sims second year of arbitration estimated to make 1.3 million dollars uh justin dunn first year of arbitration estimated to make 1.1 million dollars i think all of those guys are no-brainers now there's a couple other guys on this list And I guess there are no-brainers. Maybe there's a conversation to be had here. TJ Antone, uh, first year of arbitration, estimated at $800,000. 
I think you got to no take a flyer on TJ Antone and pay the money and see if he can come back from his second Tommy John surgery. That's easy flyer money for me. Like I don't I don't look at that and I say I, I worry about the two Tommy Johns. Like you're talking about less than a million. You absolutely need to bring him back. Plus this bullpen is going to be a fluid thing all year long. If he can have any sort of longevity and if he can prove any sort of durable then he's going to be the guy like he's going to be one of the best guys in the back end of the bullpen. And you might go back to the whole idea of bullpen ace one a and one B with Alexis Diaz and TJ Antone. I don't necessarily expect that from TJ Antone, but that is his ceiling. He, he still definitely has that ceiling for me. So I, I, I definitely think you bring him back and honestly, and I know that we, we say this name and, and there is most of reds country gets a little bit triggered, but Nick Senzel, I don't think you can just let him go at this point. Like, I think you got to recoup something. Well, his his arbitration number is estimated to be in the two point two million dollar range, and I I agree. I mean, for a couple of different reasons, I agree. I mean, to give up on him completely right now and get nothing in return for him and just let him go uh, feels like a big failure. Uh, and at $2.2 million, if he can be on the field for 140 games, that's worth the money. The problem is this. If you cut Nick Senzel, who else, who else is going to play outfield? There's yeah. nobody else to play outfield. They so, added nobody to the 40-man roster. I, I, I'll outfield. say this. I'll say this. Nick Senzel has not done a whole lot to earn having this money picked up and having right. his contract renewed. But uh, the Reds have backed themselves into a corner. I don't think they have any leverage. I don't think they have room to just chop him. And if I'm giving six million to Kyle Farmer, I'm definitely okay giving two million to Nick Senzel because there's still that potential. I think I don't necessarily know that he'll ever live up to the billing that he had when he was the number two pick. But there's still a potential that he can be a solid, usable player. I don't look at him as like a, a leadoff guy, everyday center fielder anymore, but there's still a chance that he can rewrite his script because right now his script is his clock is ticking and he's got to figure it out really, really fast. And kind of like you said, if $6 million for Kyle Farmer is okay in this baseball economy today, then $2 million to figure out if your former number two overall pick is going to figure something out is, is, is absolutely okay. Well, it's pretty clear the Reds have a, a few decisions to make. Uh, it's likely that they're going to keep all of these guys. Uh, probably they're going to have some conversations, probably about the same guys that we just did. But ultimately, I think they end up keeping them all. Listen, Jeff, one decision has already been made by the Reds on an arbitration eligible player, and they signed a contract uh, with him to avoid arbitration. As a matter of fact, coming up, we're going to talk about the who and the how much. Uh, but before we get into that, let's talk about bet online. Uh, Bet Online has all of the latest in player developments, team matchups, news, and in depth articles and analysis on every game that you can find out there. As always, Bet Online remains your continued source for all of your sports wagering information with live betting and up to the minute scores for every sport imaginable. It's the fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your favorite games and events, including the NFL, Major League Baseball, the NBA, MMA. MMA, boxing and golf. I keep checking Jeff to see if there is an over under so I can take the over uh, on the number of strokes you put up on an 18 round 18 hole course, uh, but they don't have it. I think it's, it's the like, only time I say smash the under this. There you go. <laughs> But listen, they've got all that and so much more. Uh, you can head to betonline.net using your mobile device or your computer to learn more because if bet online is where the game starts. All right, we are going to jump right back into this live Aloha Friday edition of the Locked on Reds podcast. Uh, again, I joked earlier it should be sponsored by Farmers Only because that seems to be what we have to talk about today. The Reds have forced us into that corner. Uh, the comment section is open, folks. Uh, post your questions, post your comments. The third segment is going to be you in the driver's seat. We're going to take all of your questions. We're going to get into your comments. And here in this segment, too, if you have something to say about uh, uh, Buck Farmer, Kyle Farmer, anything else, drop them in. We'll try and work them in as we go. 
All right, Jeff. The Reds avoided arbitration with Farmer, but not Kyle. Buck. They went out and signed Buck to a one-year deal, uh, and I'm okay with it. I think that uh, this bullpen needs a little bit of stability. Uh, you can't start completely over from scratch. You need to keep a few guys around. And Buck Farmer demonstrated at times that he could strike out major league hitters. He could get the outs. Oh, yeah. uh, so especially towards the end of 2022. So I think that uh, I like this signing. It's not for a lot of money, but it's a guy that could actually have some value in the Reds bullpen. From a bullpen longevity or like continuity standpoint, from a talent standpoint, I love that breaking ball that he has. Whether it's a slider or a curveball or whatever that is, that thing is nasty. I think it's a curveball, but um, and also from a beard standpoint, nobody has a better beard than Buck Farmer does. Like absolutely phenomenal. So that in and of itself, I think, is worth one point seven two five million dollars for the one year. But I also look at this and I say, look. He, if he is signed to be the Reds setup man, then sure, this is a bad deal. But if you've got him for bullpen depth and you've got him for a middle relief position, I love that. I, I love that. If you can bring him in in the fifth inning, sixth inning, if you've got a starter that's been struggling and you really need to get out of that inning, I trust him to get those big outs. I don't necessarily look at him and say that he is a candidate to be a bullpen ace, but I think that he is an important cog. To this bullpen and before i get to your take about this i have some breaking news i just saw that uh steve offenbaker's uh favorite 2022 cincinnati red taylor motter just signed with the st louis cardinals your oh response. dear god i i hope above <laughs> all hope that they actually run him out there in some games because he can't hit and what he lacks in hitting either. He lacks even more in fielding. That's great. Send him out there. Put him at the hot corner. You watch him fix him, and he hits like 30 bombs or something. I don't know. Uh, no, that, I, I thought that was funny, though. But, yeah, no, I, I love the signing. I love that they're keeping Buck Farmer. He was a guy that whenever I looked at the arbitration eligible list, I was just like, please don't make him a 40-man roster casualty to save some Rule 5 guys, and please don't make him a non-tender casualty because I think he can be productive for this team this year. And I, I like this signing because in, in theory, as long as everything goes the way that it's supposed to go, the back end of this bullpen is going to be Alexis Diaz and it's going to be Lucas Sims. Those are going to be your two guys at the mm -hmm. back end. Uh, Santian should be coming back healthy. You know, that's another, you know, above average arm that should factor into that mix. And then you get into guys like this. And I think that from a, from a strategic viewpoint, that's what also made Jeff Hoffman expendable is that you keep Buck Farmer around to kind of fill that role in the middle innings. Yeah. And, 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 and as I said earlier, they may still bring Hoffman back on a, on a prove it deal. So uh, already that foundation is better in the bullpen. You know, that's four spots that you can lock up that are, are decent major league pitchers. And then you build from that. You maybe go out and sign a guy you, you give a, uh, a couple guys uh, approve it chance towards the end of spring training. So uh, I think this kind of signing, this Buck Farmer signing is important because they do have to lay that foundation if they're going to try and get creative with anybody else uh, during the course of spring training, uh, moving towards the beginning of next season. They got to they got to have at least, you know, three or four solid arms out there so that they can experiment and try and find a deal somewhere else. 100 percent. And. The uh, other added benefit of Buck Farmer is there's nobody else on the roster that just absolutely stokes the imagination of those who might be half in the bag in the stadium and just screaming, Buck, yeah, all over the stadium. I, I love that. I wish that was more of a thing. I'll tell you this, though. Looking at the roster now, he is only the third player that's under contract for this next season. You have a lot of pre-arbitration eligible guys who are going to get the minimum who are technically you know, under contract. It's just they're not going to make the kind of money that everybody's got to look at and wonder if that's too much. And then you've got six guys we've already talked about that are arbitration eligible. You also, by the way, and shout this out, this is a great little thing that if you're out with your friends and you want to wow them with your Reds facts right now, at least until the non-tender deadline hits tonight at 8 p.m., um, right now Ken Griffey Jr. is the Reds' third highest player. His deferred salary of just slightly over $3 million is third on the Reds uh, contract list at the moment. So uh, put him in right field. 
That's what I yeah. think. <laughs> yeah, put him in right field. But yeah, I mean that's a that's a roster. You're talking about nine guys out of forty that have guaranteed major league contracts that are going to be over the minimum. So I think all total the Reds are at like ninety million when you add all of that together. So I, I just think, and you're talking about the the estimated arbitration value there for the ninety million. That's got to mean that they've got something to do. They've got got some money to do something with. You know, and this is, this is interesting. Uh, from the comment section, Greg Hughes says you can lose 100 games a year cheaper. That's, uh, that's the Reds' plan. You know, I mean, yeah, that's ownership's plan is to do this as cheaply as possible. But they did pay $120 million for a team I, that lost 100 games. I, I just... I don't know that they're going to cut payroll much more than they have. I, I I really firmly believe they're going to kind of stick it at the level that it was in 2022. Uh, the There's idea no ability is that, to, though. I mean, you can't trade Joey and you can't trade yeah. Moose for two totally different reasons. And so you're just not going to save any money if you cut Kyle Farmer or anything like that. You're going right. to save $6 so million. With, like, really? So with that being said, I mean, I think that they're just going to get a little bit smarter with how they spend the money. But I, yeah. don't see, I don't see them cutting a whole lot more. I think that we – and we've also said this a couple of different times this year. There is something to this whole idea that in 2024 they're going to have zero guaranteed contracts on the books. It's all going to be arbitration or pre-arbitration eligible people so what they can do with that is going to be interesting i don't look and think that they're going to make a huge move to add a ton of money this off season but if they add a one or two year contract type dude you're probably still talking about trading that guy at the deadline so long as he's performing well enough and he's healthy enough because i i mean you know going back to donovan solano i think that that's what they would have done with him had he had been healthy all year and been playing it's just he hadn't been healthy enough to trade. So when you're looking at any type of move that the Reds make this offseason, it's going to be to uh, bolster the depth of the roster early on in the season and hopefully a guy that can provide some value in the trade market come July because other than who they could possibly add, there's not any other guys that you're looking on on this roster and saying, okay, we're going to be able to get some more prospects or we're going to be able to get something for this guy. You know, Jeff, I think the Reds are operating pretty secure in the knowledge that they have a strong foundation coming. And mm -hmm. I think they believe in their plan and, you know, a lot of the details of their plan, they've tucked away. They're going to keep them safe. They're going to keep them secure. Uh, we know some other people that can help keep things safe and secure. Yes, we do. And they are. Simply Safe. You've got to check out Simply Safe today because they've got a great thing going on. If you go to simplysafe.com slash locked on MLB, you'll be able to save 50% off of a home security system from Simply Safe. Because did you know that over the holidays, property crimes like burglaries and package thefts just absolutely spike? People, I mean, everybody's pretty nice over the holidays except for people that like to steal stuff and apparently they get even busier around this time of year so that is why you need simply safe to help secure everything that's going on this holiday season order your simply safe system for half off today and enjoy advanced security and greater peace of mind as we get through thanksgiving as we get through christmas and, and all the different holidays that everybody celebrates here's why i love simply safe it's super customizable. There's not a situation that you have to purchase a whole bunch of stuff that you don't need in order to get the one thing that you want. You can literally pick every single part of your Simply Safe security system to have installed in your home. Speaking of installation, you can do it yourself. You don't have to wait for some professional person to schedule something with you and then you have to wait between the hours of 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. and sit around and hope that they show up between those hours. You can do it all yourself and it's very easy to install. Plus, the unit is not bulky. We're not talking about some box that's going to just absolutely mess up the whole feng shui of your house. It all integrates very well. Well, plus they have a 24 seven press uh, professional monitoring agent that helps uh, you by using fast protect technology exclusively from simply safe to capture critical evidence and verify the threat is real. So you can get priority police response, customize the perfect system for your home 
in just a few minutes. And by heading to simplysafe.com slash locked on MLB, you can save 50% half off your Simply Safe security system today by going to simplysafe.com slash locked on MLB. There is no safe like Simply Safe. Thanks for joining us on today's Aloha Live edition of the Locked On Reds podcast. You can follow us on all platforms, including right here on YouTube. If this is your first time checking us out, thank you. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and the bell to get notified whenever we have new content, like if the Reds make a signing, a big move this for this offseason, some kind or you know, some kind of move. That we'll have some emergency podcasts to let you know what's going on and how good this player is and what this means for the Reds roster. Plus, we have Aloha Fridays that we're going to try to do every week that's not going to happen next week obviously we got thanksgiving and black friday everybody be with their families and talk reds baseball with them i'm sure they'll love that uh but yeah thank you uh otherwise and and also follow us on twitter for as long as twitter is a thing you can follow me at jeff carr with three f's and you can follow steve at s offenbaker with two f's all right steve um we've i'm sure before Jeff, before we dive into this, for our audio feed listeners, that's going to do it for this edition. Uh, Coming up now, we're going to do a live Q&A with our comment section and our live viewers over here on YouTube. Uh, For the audio guys, that's going to come in your feed here in just a little bit as a bonus episode. You can uh, listen to that Q&A. But for the audio folks, that's going to do it for this edition. Make sure you tune in next week because we will keep you locked on Reds every single day. All right, now for you folks that have joined us live today, we love having you here, and this is my favorite part of the show. Yeah. I love the Q&A. I love the comments. The comment sections are open. I need questions. Hit me up, guys. Let's talk about what you want to talk about. We're going to just go with this right now. I'm going to say this wrong. Maybe it's Mr. Sayless. Maybe it's Mr. Sales. I don't know. Mr. Sir, I am sorry if I pronounced that wrong. But your point is this. Uh, he says, they are not trying, they being the Reds, are not trying to win right now. Play all the young players. Build them up. All right, Jeff. I, I, I This comes up a lot. And I, I have a mixed bag of feelings on this because – I feel like, yes, I want the young players up at the major league level as soon as possible, but I don't want to do it in such a way like I don't want to just say, well, the Reds are bad. Noel V. Marte is starting tomorrow, whether he can hit a major league breaking ball or not. He's going to get out there and learn it by God. And I'm just afraid doing that will derail progress if we move people up too soon. Uh, I know everybody doesn't agree with that, but I think that plays a little part in what is wrong with Jose Barrero. I think they brought him up just a touch too soon. And I don't want to see that happen. I don't want to see that happen to a lot of these prospects. I think that's why there's always a bit of a turn your nose up whenever the Reds make a move for a guy that is a retread or is a a prove it type player because people just think, well, we've got these top prospects. Why aren't we playing them? There's a lot of guys that aren't ready. I mean, Noevi Marte is not ready. Edwin Arroyo is years away. He's not ready. Um, there's some pitchers that are exciting. I, I kind of wonder about Andrew Abbott. Could he play his way into the rotation this year? Maybe, but it won't be till later. I, I, there's, there's different guys that whether or not the Reds are actually trying to win this year, you can damage their personal development by calling them up too early. This is the same thing as to if you were to give like a, a young kid who just started out at a company a management role. He doesn't have a feel for what's going on here, so why on earth are you giving him the reins right now? I, I look at this when it comes to uh, you know Ellie De La Cruz. I want to make sure that he's ready because he has set everything on fire, but he hasn't seen AAA just yet. Everyone who has gone through the minor leagues always says that AA is when baseball starts to feel like professional baseball. The low A's, you've got a lot of guys who are just kind of there, just trying to keep their dream alive, but not necessarily top prospect type dudes. In AA, things start to, you know, kind of ramp up a little bit. And then when you get to AAA, then you really start to see that challenge. So how does he really react to that? And that's why I don't think we see him on opening day. I still think we see him sometime in May. I don't think it's going to be very long because I firmly expect him to just own up to that challenge and kill it. But I don't want him to come up before we know that he's ready because there is a finite point when a prospect is ready to see major league pitching and major league hitting. And if they come up too soon, then we're, uh, you know, 
it, it's not going to be good for their personal development. Well, Carrick Melvin jumped in on our payroll talk there in the last segment and says that he thinks he could see the Reds spending about $120 million this next season. And I think that's where you and I were when we talked mm-hmm. about this a few weeks ago. Uh, and then uh, spending as much as $130, $140 million in 2024, uh, he says uh, we can be good. I agree. I think the Reds can definitely be good in 2024 and beyond. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't think their payroll number in, in 2024 will be anywhere near $140 million just because of some of what you said, Jeff. There's not any players that are going to be under contract. There's going to be a lot of youth on this roster that are making league minimum. They're not going to be making big money contracts. There's going to be some supplementing of that roster with some free agent signings, I think. But those are going to be like bridge and band-aid guys i i think this team could I, i've said this before i think by 2024 2025 the reds could find themselves in a situation of having one of the best records in baseball with one of the lowest payrolls in baseball i don't think that 140 is out of the question and the reason that i believe that is because i think they can split up what they paid for joey Votto and mike Mustakis amongst guys like tyler stevenson jonathan india um you know, Hunter Green, Nick Lodolo, and turn them into maybe buying out one or two years of their free agency. I really want the Reds to explore what the Braves do. And, and I think the reason that the Braves are so successful at it is because no other team really thinks about this. They're just like, well, we got them under arbitration. We can worry about that whenever arbitration comes. And Atlanta's just like, let's lock them up. Let's buy a couple of years of free agency before they really shoot up to the high point of their value. And the Reds absolutely need to explore that. I think that would be the reason, not because they go out and they make a signing for a dude over $20 million a year, but because they have more guys with long-term contracts of around, you know, 10 to $15 million average annual value. Our buddy John Park has got into the comment section. Anybody that reads John Park in our comment section know he loves to challenge us and, and kind of come at our takes a little bit. But, you know, here's a comment from him. He says, anybody on the Reds who has talent is marked and is susceptible to being put on the trading block. Yes, absolutely. That's the new model, folks. And I know it's hard to adjust to. Uh, we are never going to be the Los Angeles Dodgers. They're never going to sign nine position players to 10-year deals apiece and spend $250 million. It's never going to happen. They have committed and gone all in on this model of maybe keeping one or two guys that are faces of the franchise. And everybody else is going to get flipped when they have one and a half to two years of team control remaining. That's the new model. And you can either get attached to a few of these players and then be just really angry when they get traded, or you can find yourself in a position where you just get attached to the winning. And I want to get attached to the winning because we have not had that in a very long time. Winning cures all ails, right? Like when, once the Reds start winning, we're going to stop questioning it. But I, I don't think that the Reds are making any kind of big time trades this year like the the only one i could possibly see happening would be some kind of surprise move where they flip like like i don't know like they flip jonathan india for for somebody who's going to be really awesome but see now you're that would trying be to start trouble Trade that would jonathan be the only india. thing what right? are you I, just, doing? I don't think it's actually going to happen it's trying to like clickbait people or something trade jonathan <laughs> india oh my goodness danny new oh weighs gosh. in on this same thing he says too many up at the same time means that too many are out the door at the same time this another, is true this point, is yeah. a great point and this is a concern that i have for the starting rotation because uh, nick Lodolo and hunter green are going to come up and graham ashcraft are all going to come up at the same time and then whoever makes the rotation out of stout and williamson are going to come up the following year so there's going to be some interesting decisions have to be made and you have to assume that one of the guys in that rotation are going to be one of those uh faces that they try and extend with a contract so uh, maybe they'll maybe they'll take your comments to heart jeff and use that atlanta braves model on the rotation Yeah, because they could then control and they could taper the, you know, the loss of control of a player based on the contracts that they give him. Maybe it'll be like, okay, we'll give Lodolo six years. We'll give Hunter Green five years. We'll give Graham Ashcraft five or four years or something like that. And then they can kind of push that decision down the road a little bit because I I think that a smart team 
gets proactive in this. Now we have not seen the reds be proactive in a long time, but they were a little bit ahead of the curve when it came to trading some guys and getting some good talent for them from Castillo and Mally and all that. So I wonder if they will continue this new way of running the team and start exploring some contract negotiations with their young guys. All right, here's another one from our buddy Carrick, and I'm gonna I'm gonna let you jump in on this one first. Go ahead, give a read. Take it away. <sighs> this is a tough one, just because I think that the talent for DLC is a lot more than CES. Now DLC is Ellie De La Cruz, and CES is Christian Encarnacion Strand. I think that and, both. And Carrick's question is, who will come up first? Yes, and, and I think that you know, especially hitting wise, both of them had very good years last year. In fact, if you look up their production. Uh, CES and DLC both had similar power numbers. The thing of it is uh, CES is not at a position of need. Uh, he plays first base and really the reds have a bunch of guys who can play first base right now. And if you're not playing first base, you're probably playing DH. And so the reds just have too many guys that can fill into that spot. I think that once we see a couple of moves made, maybe some guys get, uh, you know, maybe, you know, moose or something. Maybe you trade him. Maybe you sign, you know, do the whole Matt Kemp thing and wave goodbye and hand him a check in May or June or something like that. Maybe then you could see some move for Christian Encarnacion strand coming up, but I get the feeling that it's going to be Ellie De La Cruz before CES. Oh, I, I totally agree. I, I, Ellie De La Cruz is the next position player up guys. He is the next one to make his debut. There's nobody else waiting in the wings. that's going to come up as a position player before Ellie De La Cruz does. I, I just, I can't, I can't fathom a situation where that happens. Uh, the only one, the only thing I might say on that is maybe Matt McLean, but I still think McLean is working a lot on his plate discipline. And I think that they will give him more time than Ellie De La Cruz. Because I know that, and everybody marks the high strikeout percentage for Ellie De La Cruz, but he still has amazing production on top of that strikeout percentage. So I'd love to see if that can continue to translate in the big leagues. Carrick, you know, I, I love Carrick. Carrick, thank you so much for being so dedicated to the show. You always challenge us to think and you provide us great information. And I, I really appreciate you, man. I don't know. I know we don't we don't say that enough in our back and forth interactions, but uh, you know, he he seems to think, Jeff, that the Reds are gonna withhold bringing up Ellie De La Cruz until September because they want to keep him eligible for the rookie of the year in 2024. And I know there's some draft pick implications with that. I believe if they win the rookie of the year is there's, there's something with the draft picks, but I, I'm going to tell you right now, there is no way they keep Ellie De La Cruz in the minor leagues all the way through September. Unless the, I mean, the only way that happens is if he goes to Louisville and can't hit the broadside of a barn and his track record says that's not what's going to happen. Right. I, I just, I don't see that being part of the plan. It's a nice, it's a nice like added, side thing for us fans, but I don't think, uh, front offices consider awards when they consider building a roster. They hope that their guys compete for awards because if they have guys on the roster, that are competing for awards, i.e. the Braves that went one, two in the NL rookie of the year probably means that they're a pretty good team as a whole. But to say that that is an aim and a reason as to why they would target September and I'd be surprised if it's not, I'd be surprised if we get through half of the season, we haven't seen Ellie De La Cruz yet. John Park jumps back in talking about the relief pitchers, Jeff. Uh, he says, I feel like there's a huge vacuum in the relief pitcher space and they have a huge need for a couple starting pitchers. In other words, they have a huge challenge and very few dollars. Um, I don't know that I would say that the need for starting pitchers is a huge need for starting pitchers. I, I, I mean, I really think at this point it shakes out to it would be really nice if they went out and signed a number four guy. I think one through three are a lock right now with Lodolo green and Ashcraft. I think number five is going to be one of Williamson or stout. And that leaves you really needing to fill that number four. I guess you could argue they need to go sign two starting pitchers to have a spare. Uh, but I think you've got a couple spares because we, we didn't even discuss Luis Sessa there. We, if only one of Williamson or stout makes the rotation, you've got the other guy 
if there's an injury being able to step in. So, I mean, yeah, they need to go sign a guy. And, and Jeff, I think, yeah, I, I told you, 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 it's very rare that I think you have a genius thought, but your, your, your idea on Kluber here at the number four, I think is fantastic. I mean, how about a rotation that goes Lodolo green, Ashcraft Kluber, and then Williamson or stout. That's a pretty damn good starting rotation. I would like to see that because I think that this year, specifically for the bullpen, because I do agree with his take about the bullpen kind of being a vacuum, not necessarily because it's devoid of talent, but it's because it's devoid of guys that you trust on a day in and day out basis. There's guys that have good ceilings, but there's also guys that have low floors. So you're still worried about whenever you call on that guy from the bullpen. But I think that this year will be a big year for figuring out who in this organization can fill out those bullpen spots because you're getting back all of your key uh, contributors from injury. And you're going to be able to see how they fit in with Alexis Diaz. But also you've got these young dudes that are coming up and, and you have kind of gotten ahead of the curve with Justin Dunn and saying he looks more like a relief pitcher. You're going to figure out whether Levi Stout uh, can start to stick as a starting pitcher or a relief pitcher. And you've got some other dudes who aren't necessarily on the top prospect list, but the Reds will have them called up to make their debuts and see what they can provide for the major league team. And whether that's in the rotation of the bullpen, this year is going to be a big prove it season for the supporting cast of the pitching staff. The Reds have their core of their pitching staff. They have their top three starters and their closer. Now they need to figure out who fills in the margins. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's well said. I, I think that, you know, I, I would agree with John that there's a a bigger need anyway for relief pitchers than mm -hmm. than starting pitchers. But, um, you know, I think the back half of that bullpen is really where the work needs to be done. You know, positions five through eight. If we're talking about an eight man bullpen. I think they've probably got three or four guys that will build a foundation and they're going to have to fill out the rest yes. via free agency. And interesting enough, Austin Bowley's asking us about uh, looking ahead even farther to 2024. And if there's any free agents, we'd like the Reds to pursue next off season. And I got to tell you, this is a hard exercise because uh, guys could get signed to extensions. They may not hit free agency. Things may not open up. The other reason that that's a hard exercise is I think the Reds, as far as being active in the free agent market, are going to have to really wait until we see how these prospects develop in 2023 and actually who's on the big league roster heading into the 2023 off season and to the beginning of the 2024 season. I think there's way too many variables to really speculate that far ahead for me. Anyway, uh, I think that if everything goes right, the reds are hoping they don't have a lot of needs and they don't need to go out and sign a whole lot of guys other than a couple uh, bench uh, fillers and, you know, a patch band-aid kind of signing. Yeah. Because the key contributors are going to come from within, um, looking and I just kind of did like a quick look as to what spot track says about potential free agents next year. Like there's a couple of interesting names. It'd be interesting to see if they could bring Ian Happ to Cincinnati. He always seems to play very well in Cincinnati. Maybe you, hey, can do if you it can't beat him. If you can't beat him, sign him. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Bring him in. Um, there's not really a whole lot of interesting names on this list. And it's funny because they even list Cody Bellinger, but there is some thought that Cody Bellinger might be non-tendered by the Dodgers this year. Now, I don't know if that means he's going to still maintain a lot of money. You're talking about a award winner. You're not talking about a dude who hasn't had a good career so far. But I, I, I don't necessarily look at the next year's free agent list and see anybody that jumps out that I think the Reds should go after. Plus, I think, and, and this could be an entire show topic, so I'm just kind of dropping this thought in here for a moment, but I think I would prioritize the Reds locking up their young players for multiple years over spending that money Absolutely. on big-time free agents next year. Absolutely. I, that, I agree 100%. That's what I think should happen. And I think uh, that's how they'll prioritize it, too. Our buddy Jason... Stalgren, 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 right. Jason Stalgren. All Thanks, right. Jeff. Sorry, Appreciate guys. You, hey, listen, I'm coming off an overnight shift, guys. I just going to put that <laughs> out there. Now we're far enough into the show. I'll complain about it a little bit. I worked the ER 12 <laughs> hours last night. I'm, I'm barely hanging on. Uh, 
But uh, Jason says, hey, guys, not sure if you can see this message, but keep up the great work. Lifelong Reds fan. And to be honest, you guys made last season one of the, my most enjoyable. And he laughs out loud. Uh, hey, thanks. Appreciate you. Um, Appreciate you. You, know, you guys are you guys are great. I, listen, I, I I tell Jeff all the time. I love the interaction uh, when we're out at the ballpark and and people come up and talk to us and talk baseball. is my that's why I love hanging out at the ballpark. You guys make it great. You make it great here on YouTube and in the social media spaces. You make it great when we're in person. Thank you guys so much. Really do appreciate all the feedback. Uh, Carrick following up on what we had to say. Uh, he thinks they're more likely to bring up CES than they. This this is interesting. I I don't know, Carrick. I I mean, I just can't env envision a scenario where they where they do this, where they bring anybody else up before Ellie De La Cruz. There's the just way too much hype train hurt. right now. Yeah, say I mean, that again. Maybe if he gets hurt, but if he's healthy, if everybody's healthy, I I think that he's he's going to be the first one up. And I know I, I, the K percentage thing just for me is not a big deal and i know that that's weird to say because we've seen aristides aquino hit we've seen jose barrero hit but we've also seen have Omeo we Cruz. have we really seen jose okay. barrero hit the lack Jeff? of hitting the lack of okay hitting. There, that's but better. i'm but my point Tell is we've truth. also seen o'neill cruz o'neill cruz does not have a good strikeout percentage but there is nobody that doesn't think this dude is going to be the best hitter in the pirates lineup this season and i've i find that to be the case with ellie de la cruz Danny New, tagging on to our bullpen conversation, says he would love to see a bullpen that includes Sims, Antone, Santion, Farmer, and Diaz. I, he would like to see what that would look like. Me too. I think that's probably a 2024 look, though, because I, I'm not sure what we can count on, if anything at all, from TJ Antone. And, and I know he's working hard, but I can't imagine he's going to be ready anytime before the, the midway mark in 2023 three coming off that second Tommy John surgery. Jeff, do you, have you, have you paid attention at all to his timeline? I've kind of put him on the back burner in my mind just because it's, it's such a difficult rehab. I've kind of got him marked for may, maybe June. I, I think I, he's not going to break camp with the team. At least. I mean, if he is cleared to play and, and if he's healthy, but I think he's going to start camp late, which means his season will start late. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're talking about pre Second Tommy John surgery, TJ Antone. You're talking about 2021 Lucas Sims. And you're talking about something from Tony Santion that is very close to 2021 as well. And you put him to get, put those together with Alexis Diaz. And then you have Buck Farmer kind of as the depth guy, the, the, uh, you know, breaking case of emergency guy, then. I'm all in on that kind of a bullpen, and I don't necessarily think you have to spend a ton of money. It's just along with our whole talk of is a prospect going to pan out, we're now talking about some guys that have a lot of question marks. There's so many question marks on this team that I feel like it would be a little bit foolish and definitely setting ourselves up for disappointment if we think that every single one of those question marks are going to pan out. Damon Rice checks in and says, hopefully produce sales pick up next year and the SOB himself, that son of Bob, folks, <laughs> Phil Castellini will secure a few of our young stars. Jeff, I think this piggybacks off of what you were saying with adopting a bit of the Atlanta Braves model of locking up the 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 youth. And, you know, I, I think that resonates with a lot of people. I mean, you can see it there, you know, that they we really want to get these young guys locked up. I understand the sentiment. Um, I just I, I'm, I'm not sure they're going to go that route. I really think that they have made an organizational commitment to to flipping for for prospects. I think that's really where we're going. I think that that the model for spending is going to be that. And then you're probably talking about I, I would be. I don't know that I'd be shocked, but I would be surprised if we see the Reds make a move to add an outside player who makes more than $10 million a year. Yeah, I think I agree with that. At least Scrolling. until ownership changes. I think that's just how. Right. And well, and, and I don't know that ownership's ever going to change. Um, right. The days of the date. Listen, folks, the days of produce stand owners being able to buy into major league baseball are over. These franchises are valued in the billions of dollars, not in the millions of dollars now. And, you know, 
as, as sad as it is, I don't know that the Castellanis will ever sell this team. They, they've got too good a racket going on right now, and I, I just I don't see it happening. Um, I'm scrolling the comments here, Jeff. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Danny New agrees with you. Corey Kluber. Uh, just very briefly, Jeff, kind of rehash your take on that, why you think he's a good signing for the Reds. Yeah, I mean, he's he's a dude who's done it before. He's a Cy Young Award winner, and he, he just had kind of a an okay season last year. Not a great season, but an okay season, and it ended poorly in the playoff game for the Rays where he blew their last game of the year. And I don't necessarily think that every general manager is going to weigh that over his entire career, but they're going to look at his age too. And if you're talking about a contending team, then they're probably going to offer him the minimum. And then if you can be the red, if you can be the reds and swoop in with a little bit of uh, maybe like, you know, I don't know, $5 million or something on a prove it deal with maybe some incentives to bump that up and some incentives to stay healthy and things like that. Then I think the reds could bring him in and maybe even flip him at the deadline. If he continues, you know, if he does prove it uh, because he's shown it in the past and I just don't think that he's ready to hang him up. But I also don't think that a contending team is ready to commit to him because you can compare him to Johnny Cueto, who they're both pretty much at the same spots in their career. But Johnny Cueto was awesome last year he for the White Sox beast. and Absolutely. a contending team is going to want him. All right, Jeff, our, our viewers, they never let us down. The questions are getting better and better and better and better and a little bit more challenging. Um, let's go to Cincinnati crew. Cincinnati crew wants to know where we think Aristides Aquino will be at the start of the 2023 baseball season. Um, I'm not sure where you're at on Je this Jeff. I think, I don't think he's going anywhere. I think he's going to be in Goodyear for spring training and they're going to flirt with the idea of, of finding a way to put him back on this roster. Maybe, um, I don't know though, because I think this is where Aquino's got to look at himself and look at his own career and be like, what is the best move for me? Because I know if I go back there, the only reason that I'm playing is because they are once again, super depleted, which obviously we saw last year that could happen. But then there's also the case of, does he want to know that he's going to play every single day? And that makes me wonder if he doesn't go overseas in some sort of capacity. Maybe he goes to Japan, maybe he goes to Korea, something like that, because we've seen other players from other organizations who struggled early on in their career, go overseas, work on some stuff, get the chance to play every day and be a big part of a team and then come back and see some success. So I wonder if he tries that route. Cause I just, I don't know that any other major league team, because I know that our buddy uh, uh, over uh, Locked On Pirates, Ethan, has said he's just like, yeah, he's going to be a, a Reds Pirate killer Hall for the of Pirates. Famer. Yeah, he's going to be a Pirates Hall of Famer. I don't even know if the Pirates are going to take a, a, a flyer on Aquino because I, I think the Pirates are on the come up anyway. But um, do we I know if Aquino is playing majors. winter ball anywhere? Is he on a winter league team right now? I think he was in the Dominican. I think I thought he was on the same team with Ellie De La Cruz. Okay. Well, let's, let's go on to, uh, another, uh, outfielder question. Are the reds keeping Fairchild? He seems safer than Senzel right now. Uh, I think the outfield is so depleted. They got to keep them both. Uh, but Fairchild absolutely played his way into an opportunity to have a significant role with this team in 2023. Uh, you know, we've, Someone in the, I wish I could remember who said it in the YouTube comments that called it the F troop out there with Fairchild, Fraley, and uh, the other guy. Friedel. Friedel. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yes, I'm, yes. I, I'm drawing and, a blank there. But yeah, so I, I, I think Fairchild is is definitely going to have a role on this team in 2023. Sorry. I was on a one track mind and I looked it up, and, and Carrick, I see in the comments also, uh, gave us a confirmation he was he was in uh he was on the and i'm going to butcher this but i think it was lise the the team with elliot de la cruz in the dominican mm -hmm. winter league but yeah i still think his numbers were very similar to what he was putting up i we just we know what aquino Ooh. is and i think the league knows who aquino is Carrick, 
Carrick is pushing back on us, man. He is, <laughs> he thinks the Reds will clear a couple more spots before the Rule 5 draft and Fairchild will be gone. I, I, I don't see it that way. I think Fairchild played his way into an opportunity in 2023, but um, well, we'll see. We'll see which one of us is right, Carrick. I, I will, if, if it goes down this way, I will shout you out. I will give you all of the credit if you're right about that. I did see some writers and some folks who cover other teams mentioning like, oh, I can't believe this guy wasn't protected from the Rule 5 draft. I don't necessarily know what that means, but I do know that it's much rarer than we give it credit for that a team finds a guy that actually sticks on a roster all year long during the Rule 5 draft. Now, I will say this, like going back in the past, I remember 2019, I think it was, the Reds took Connor Joe and they, they ended up sending him back to the Giants, and now he is a key contributor on a Rockies lineup. So it kind of makes you wonder if they had the ability to let him stick around, but I just I don't see that being the case. All right, Chris Schreiner checks in, Jeff, and his question is, what are our thoughts on what will happen with Luis Sessa? This is a good question, and I'm not sure that there's a great answer for it because – I think if you were to ask Luis Sessa what he wants his role to be, I think he wants to remain in the starting rotation. And if the Reds can't go out and sign a number four guy, if if Jeff's Corey Kluber dream falls apart, I think Luis Sessa will have that opportunity to pitch for a spot in the starting rotation. If the Reds go out and sign somebody, I think that fifth starter spot's going to go to one of the youngsters and that Sessa is going to go back into the Reds bullpen. I I think I agree, but I think the Reds need to approach his spring training in a vacuum. They need to look at him specifically and plan for him to be a starter. And then if it doesn't work out, he can still be a bullpen guy. Like it's much much easier for a starter to turn into a reliever than for a reliever to turn into a starter. And we saw that because when he first started, when they first started throwing him into the rotation, he was rough. He really didn't pitch that deep into games and he kind of got absolutely blasted by about the third or fourth inning. But as he went along and his couple of his last couple of starts seemed a little bit more promising. I wouldn't mind seeing it in spring training, but I also, I don't necessarily know that I put him in the top three as far as rotation candidates go, but I, I definitely want to see them work him into the season as a starter and then retreat back to the bullpen if they need to. All right, guys, you're doing great in the comments. We're going to keep trying to plow through some of these, uh, keep dropping them in. Uh, I'm not out of steam yet. It looks like Jeff's doing okay too. We're just going to keep right on digging folks. Uh, Jared on vinyl says he sees some Austin Riley in Spencer steer. Uh, he's hoping that uh, like Steer that. makes some big strides this season. Uh, he loves how patient steer is at the plate. Uh, could be really nice for the reds. Once he settles in and get adjust to major league pitching. Basically, I want to tell you what, when I sat down and talked with Spencer steer, uh, you know, he struck me as a guy that is going to figure it out very quickly. Uh, he puts in the work, he puts in the effort, uh, he knows baseball. I, you know, I really enjoyed speaking with him and, and I came away and, and Jeff can, can confirm this. I came away from that interview. Very, very excited. After I talked to Spencer steer, uh, I agree, Jared, I think that Spencer is going to be a very valuable piece, uh, to this reds team. And once Kyle Farmer is gone, whenever that is, uh, Spencer Steer, I think, is who the Reds should look to to make the for at least a couple seasons more permanent super utility. I like his flexibility, his versatility. Uh, I think he needs full time at bats. Uh, but I do like how he can kind of scoot around. And once all of the other prospects are up, I think Steer could be the guy that just spells everybody and gives everybody a day off and keeps that bat in the lineup. I really, I really like what Spencer Steer has to offer. Yeah, and if if you see some Austin Riley in there, I love that. He's a top 20 player in the major leagues. If you tell me Spencer Steer could be that good, I'm down with that. I, I love the plate discipline that I saw, and he just did not look – because I think we've seen, and I think we saw this in Nixon Zell, I think we've seen this in Jose Barrero, that there's a point where the game gets too big for them. And I know he was only up here for a month, so it's not as if the sample size is huge. But when I watched Spencer Steer, he looked like he belonged. 
he looked like there was nothing that was too big for him in this in the major league game. So I think that when you have that mentality and you have the plate discipline that he has, the rest of the numbers are going to follow. And I'm very excited to see what his 2023 looks like. BR47 wants to know if his stomach is still going to hurt in 2023 when the Reds go to the bullpen. Uh, yeah. 50-50 shot that it's not going to hurt right now. Um, we need to see what they do with uh, spots five through eight in the yeah. bullpen. But I think I think the back end of the bullpen in games where they have a lead are going to be a whole lot more reliable than they were in 2022. I think that's my answer. I agree. Um, you're still going to have those off days where it's, you know, Alexis Diaz has pitched two out of the last three or three out of the last five, and you have to go to somebody else that, yeah, that day you are going to, because the, the bullpen's not super deep. And, and while the names we know, Sims, Anton, Santion, um, and, and those guys are not necessarily 100% trustworthy just yet because they got to build themselves back up. So I, I think I'm still going to be a little bit nervous until I see some consistency out of those guys. So unfortunately, I think my answer is yes. Rob Short with another shout out for us, Jeff. I'm taking, I'm taking these pats on the back, brother. Good job this year, he says, in a year that was hard on us all, let alone trying to find positive amidst all the negatives. That y'all, that's Jeff. Jeff is Mr. Optimism. Um, I'm just along for the ride sometimes. You guys don't get to hear our pre-show meetings where he talks me off the ledge day after day <laughs> after day. So that's that's all Jeff. The optimism bleeds through from Jeff. So Jeff, that one's for you. Uh, John you know Park comes from sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> John Park, this is this, this is good. John Park says Aquino is hanging around till the league adopts the new position called designated fielder. Man, that's the true story right there. Uh, for as bad as Aristides Aquino has been at the plate, man, he is he is no joke in the outfield with that cannon. Yeah, and that's an that's one of those uh, argument points that a lot of people like to say. Well, you can make the stats say anything you want them to say. If you literally just focus on Aristides Aquino's fielding, then the Reds absolutely should have kept him. It's just half of his game is such an eyesore. We touched on this a little bit, Jeff. Do you have anything else? Greg uh, Landwehr is asking, is the Nick Senzel experiment over? Do the Reds move him this offseason? Uh, I don't think they move him because his value has never been lower, uh, and I don't think the experiment can be over because they don't have anybody else. I think the only way they move him is for some other team's prospect that is a disappointment. So then the guy we're getting back is the same guy that we already have. And I don't think that the Reds are going to make that trade. I, I think that we're still going to see him out there in the, and not necessarily every day in the center field, but as a, a guy who moves around and they're going to try to give him a bats and see if he sticks and, you know, just throw it against the wall and see what happens. Rob short, uh, Jeff, you have a take a on this. Wants to know if there's any chance Tucker Barnhart comes back. I think there's a, a better than, I don't know what. Let's call it a 40% chance Tucker Barnhart was, comes back. I yeah, think I it all say, boils man. down to how low Tucker will go, so to speak, as far as the money goes. Because, you know, he's it, he was making, what, $7.5 million in Detroit last year. Um, I don't think he's going to get anywhere near that kind of money just based on performance. But, you know, if the, if he'll sign for $3 million on a one- or two-year deal, I, he's valuable and, and the Reds need a defensive guy that can actually catch the baseball from the catcher yeah. position when Tyler Stevenson is either out of the lineup or playing another position to save his legs for part of the year. Two things happened uh, already this off season that lead me to believe that it's almost 50 50 at this point that he returns. Cause I agree. It's it's, I mean, and it's something that I always hear different people say is that, you know, free agents have agency. They have the ability to choose. So if he does choose Cincinnati, yeah, I think that the Reds should definitely be interested because of these two things. Number one, they didn't add another catcher to the 40 man roster. Whenever they were protecting guys, Daniel Veoheen was not added to the 40 man roster. Not that that was going to mean he was going to play this year anyway, but they literally just have, Tyler Stevenson and that's it so far as catchers on the 40 man roster. Plus you look at all of the other guys who went somewhere else, like Austin Romine free agent right now, uh, Mark Colesvari, Michael Papirski, uh, Chris Oki, 
all got claimed by other teams. And Chucky Robinson also elected free agency. He's not even in AAA anymore. So they do not even have the guy that we listed as their emergency, you know, fourth catcher down in Louisville. So they are going to make a move to get a catcher because there's nobody currently within this organization that can be their second catcher. I'm not going to pull up all these comments, but Carrick and, and Rob Short are having a great conversation in the comments over here about Luis Sessa and, you know, whether or not he'll be a starter. And I, I, this one's going to be fun to watch guys. I I'm with, I'm with you. I think he has a legitimate, uh, argument to be considered to be a starter. Uh, it's it just really going to depend on what they do as far as signing a guy. I think that's just really how it plays out. And I do see that it was mentioned. Yes, he has experience as a starting pitcher with the Yankees, but I think that's like saying that Kyle Farmer has experience at catcher. Like, yes, he played some catcher and Luis he did Sessa that. He did that sometime. Bit. Yeah. But it's not as if this was his profile a year or two years ago. Like, I, I think that Luis Sessa is still building up his ability to be a starting pitcher. Danny says he's buying stock in Maylox with this bullpen. Yeah, that I mean that that's a safe bet. I think for sure. Not gonna lie, I go for the Kerger brand Tums. You save some money on there. They're like the exact same thing. Works. Damon Works. Rice pops back in, uh, and Jeff, I don't know. Uh, do you know? Are there I any updates see. on the replacements to the coaching staff? Uh, very interested to learn how much criticism went towards the training group, etc., with the ridiculous amount of injuries. Listen, I will tell you folks this. Um, I have several friends within the Reds organization, um, and I can't name them, you know, for their own protection, basically. But there has been a. a, a a group that has been disgruntled with the Reds medical and training staff for several seasons now. Jeff, I know you've heard some of this stuff back channel. I've heard some of it back channel. We've talked to some of our other media friends that have heard it. Uh, it's been there. And I think the 2022 season was just the straw that broke the camel's back. Uh, you know, do the players themselves bear some responsibility in it? You know, I don't know. I know that we've talked about the fact that some of them, you know, say they're okay when they're not, and they try to be on the field when they shouldn't be. And some of that ultimately reflects poorly on the training staff and the medical staff. Uh, but at the end of the day, the Reds had an extraordinary amount of injuries in 2022. And I agree a hundred percent that they had to make a change. Even if all of the fault doesn't fall on that group, uh, there's enough evidence and enough data over the last two to three years that says the changes that were made within the training and medical departments were not good ones. They didn't work and something needed to be done. So for me, that was a move that had to happen. Uh, I haven't heard who they've brought in or if they've brought anyone in yet, uh, but I'm, I'm glad that it happened. Yeah, disenchantment i think is putting it lightly whenever it comes to how they were feeling about their training group now as far as the replacements go i have not heard any sort of reports as to what's coming up next um i gotta believe that over the holiday season that'll get finalized and they'll probably announce it around new year's or something like that um but yeah that's definitely that's going to be a bigger move uh than we give it credit for and it's not necessarily going to be one of those things that you see uh, John Morosi tweeting rumors about as if, and the Reds are, the Reds are in big with some big uh, training group. I don't even know what to put there. Uh, All right, guys, yeah. we're getting into the home stretch here. We're going to get through a few more of these. There's not a lot left, but before I put this next one up, I got to warn Jeff, do not do an accent. When I put this comment up, you are forbidden. Wayne Roberts checking in from Scotland says he really enjoys the podcast. Great points being discussed. He's a lifelong Reds fan, lifelong Reds fan living out in Scotland. Jeff, do not do it. We're not doing it. We're taking the compliments and we are rolling right along. Thank you. That's Wayne. Awesome. We I love that there's Reds fans the out in Scotland. Yes. Appreciate the kind words. Uh, Carrick asking about Stevenson. We haven't talked about Tyler Stevenson really today is if we want Stevenson to play 50% of the time at catcher, we need someone better than Tucker as a backup. Well, I don't tell you what Carrick, I want Stevenson behind the plate only about 30% of the time. So, uh, Which probably means we need two the, catchers. The, we probably, <laughs> I, you know, Tucker's just fine. And if you compare him to what they rolled out there for most of this year, he's great. Um, I think that if he sticks to one side of the plate 
and we do strategic starts uh, to uh, take advantage of his handedness and his splits. Uh, he can be okay back there. Uh, what you get from him defensively and managing the pitching staff, I think if he can hit 230, 240, I'm good with that. I'm okay with yeah. that. As long as they're not paying him an exorbitant amount of money. If he's at two, $3 million for the season, it, it, that's what he can do. And his career is red. That's what he's hit. And and I don't necessarily know that there's a lot of guys that the Reds would actually go after on this catcher's market. We've talked about it before. Like They could go after Omar Narvaez back there, but the biggest question about o Omar Narvaez is he's not great at blocking pitches. And we saw what happened when the Reds put pitchers back there that weren't great at blocking pitches last year. It, it, it equated to extra runs for other teams. So there's there's got to be a happy medium somewhere between defense and, and hitting. Rob seems surprised to learn that the Reds actually had a medical staff. Look at that. Um, yeah, no, they had guys. I don't know what they were doing, Rob, but some kind we, of bug last year. They hit. We um, definitely had them. Uh, all right. Last one. <laughs> one more. Sharon Peters checks in. The Reds need to hire handsome Tracy Jones, Jeff. What, you know, I'm curious what job, what job, do the Reds give Tracy Jones? Uh, they, um, <laughs> didn't we just talk about this like off the air the other day? <laughs> First base coach. There we go. That's a great spot to end today's podcast. Thank you all so much oh, for joining no, no, us. No, 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 no. Time out. <laughs> Hold the phone, Jeff. We have a request. Wayne Roberts from Scotland has checked in <laughs> and he wants know the I, accent. I, so I can't so, even know if I did it. Well, anyway, <laughs> thank you all so much for joining us here on this Aloha Friday of the Lockdown Reds podcast. Oh my God, I'm going to stop so right bad. there. I'm sure I'm that's offending so, Wayne. Thank so, you. Thank so you so bad. much for Thanks, joining us. And listen. Don't stop listening on that account. Um, <laughs> that'll do it. Hey guys, this has been great. Listen, all of you <laughs> folks in the comment section that have hung on throughout this whole, Hey, we've got an hour and 16 minutes here, guys. We're so grateful for you guys. We appreciate Absolutely. you downloading and listening and watching and commenting and tweeting <laughs> and, and just no, interacting no. with us. You guys are great. You're the reason we do this. Uh, before Jeff wraps up the show, I just want to one more time. I promise I won't do that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. Uh, now, make sure you go check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast. Lots of great interviews and news. They cover everything, all the biggest news in sports whenever you're talking about uh, the NFL, M NBA, everything is on Locked On Sports Today, and they do it in 22 minutes or less. So you literally could have seen it three times in the course of our podcast here today. That's Locked On Sports Today, just like Locked On Reds, free and available on all platforms. Steve, I'm doing Scottish accents poorly. The Reds, they've got some decisions to make about some non-tenders and things like that. So what's that mean for you and me? Oh, I can't put that one up. Uh, that means that you and I are going to be locked on reds every single day. We'll catch you all next time. Aloha. Get us the, get us the heck out of here.